thank you very much for that uh, very undeserved introduction. <clears throat> so walking down the street, coming up to the uh, the hall today, and old Quinn came up to me. We had worked in the archives together, and uh, he gave me something. This is the punchline. It must be in my pocket of my coat, but it's a Henry Align button. It says Henry Align Bicentenary. And uh, I guess it's being distributed in Halifax, described by Ally on a number of occasions as that Sodom and Gomorrah. I see. I feel like a magician without his uh, rabbit. <laughs> I may have, in fact, performed the greatest trick of all time. I've made Henry Alline disappear. <laughs> I'll find him, don't worry. Some of you have little faith. <laughs> Jerry Zeman is not selling them. <laughs> Yet. Some 75 years after Aline's death in New Hampshire, an especially acerbic Presbyterian divine was disturbed at the continuing influence being exerted throughout Western Nova Scotia by Alliance. He is spoken of as an eminent minister of the gospel. He was sadly reported in 1859 by thousands who were convinced that he had done more good by his labors than any other minister that ever lived in Nova Scotia. Most of these Nova Scotians, of course, had never met Alliance face to face. But their positive view of the Falmouth preacher had been largely shaped by an oral culture, a culture which helped them to reconstruct an awareness of a distant past. These Nova Scotians saw Aline through the eyes of those of their neighbors who had actually seen and heard the Whitfield of Nova Scotia. As late as 1856, for example, a 93-year-old Mrs. Fox, a daughter of one of Aline's early converts, Benjamin Cleveland, the Horton hymn writer, still vividly remembered listening to her first Christian sermon, one preached by Aline in 1780. The sermon she once observed made a deep impression on my mind. Seventy-six years after the event, she still recalled Aline's text, John 12, 35. It was observed that Mrs. Fox says she never heard Mr. Aline preach but it warmed her heart. She heard him very often. She used frequently to travel several miles to hear him and never heard him without there being something fresh and new in his discourses. Mrs. Fox, moreover, could still describe Aline as a man of middling size, straight and very thin, of light complexion, with light curly hair and blue eyes, with a solemn expression and his dress was neat but plain. All of his conversation, she stressed, was very spiritual, and Aline would not converse about the world at all, except as urged by necessity. He was mighty in prayer, she maintained, and was a good singer and loved singing. Mrs. Fox and other Nova Scotians who had known Aline could only endorse with enthusiasm and conviction the last line of the inscription chiseled into his New Hampshire tombstone. He was a burning and shining light and was justly esteemed the apostle of Nova Scotia. Despite the fact that Aline did not always preach what one Nova Scotian described in July of 1784 as right 
sound doctrine, end of quote, he was nevertheless widely perceived in his lifetime and afterwards as a man sent of God who promoted a remarkable work of God. Amos Hilton, one of Alline's most influential Yarmouth converts, expressed in 1782 what he must have realized was the widespread view concerning Alline's so-called heretical views. When pressed by the Reverend Jonathan Scott, Alline's bitter congregational church critic, on why he would, would accept a gospel in which, in quotes, all the revelation of God's word is overthrown, end of quote, Hilton simply replied, it was no matter of any great consequence to him what a man's principles were if he was but earnest in promoting a good work. In other words, Hilton was arguing that it was not really important what a preacher's theology actually was. What was important was whether he was truly an instrument of the Holy Spirit and his preaching moved people to experience that central new light experience, regeneration and new birth. Alline's radical evangelical and new light message, especially in its Nova Scotia context, it is clear, in its essentials at least, reflected intense, reflected an emphasis upon the major elements of the evangelical tradition. But there's also, I've stressed in other lectures, an important heterodox element in the volatile mixture making up Alline's theology. And many of Alline's contemporaries were aware of the potentially explosive nature of his highly mystical theology. In a particularly discerning critique of Alline's theology, the Reverend Matthew Ritchie pointed out that the Falmouth preacher's theology was a strange mixture of undigested, often conflicting points of view. According to Ritchie, there were fragments of different systems without coherence and without any mutual relation or dependence. With the strong assertion of man's freedom as a moral agent, he connected the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints. He allegorized to such excess the plainest narratives and announcements of scriptures that the obvious and unsophisticated import of the words of inspiration was often entirely lost amidst the reveries of mysticism. Not all of Alline's followers would be as concerned as he was with neutralizing the antinomian potential of the perseverance of the saints by stressing the importance of living the good Christian life. Even during his last few years in Nova Scotia, some of his followers may have pushed his gospel to and beyond its antinomian breaking point. But the vast majority would be content to remain traditional Alanite new lights, orthodox yet a little mystical, obsessed as was their charismatic leader with the rapture and ecstasy of the new birth. Such men and women, not surprisingly, sang with enthusiasm the New Light hymn and made it their own unique testimony. Come all who are New Lights indeed, who are from sin and bondage freed. From Egypt's land we have took our flight, for God has given us a new light. Long time we with the wicked trod and madly ran the sinful road against the gospel we did fight, scarred the name of a new light. At length the Lord in mercy called and gave us strength to give us all. He gave us grace to choose the right, a portion with despised new light. Though by the world we are disdained and have our names cast out by men, yet Christ our captain for us fights, nor death nor hell can hurt new light. I know not any sect or part, but such is our new lights in heart. If in Christ Jesus you delight, I can pronounce you a new light. For since in Christ we are all are one, my soul would fain let strife alone. No prejudice can ever bear, nor wrath in those who new lights are. Thus guided by the Lord, we stand safe in the hollow of his hand, nor do we scorn the new light's name. The saints are all new light. Amen. Amen, amen, so let it be. Glory to God, this light we see, new light from Christ to, to us is given new light will be our light in heaven. Now, most Nova Scotians during and after Alline's lifetime were not overly concerned 
with his so-called heretical views, realizing the centrality of the New Light radical evangelicalism in his Christian message. A perceptive critic of the religious life of Nova Scotia, and certainly a person who is not a New Light enthusiast, Simeon Perkins, the famous Liverpool merchant and civic leader, once observed in February of 1783, Mr. Ally made a long speech, very sensible, advising all sorts of people to a, to a religious life and gave many directions for their outward walk. This is a wonderful day and evening. Never did I behold such an appearance of the Spirit of God moving upon the people since the time of the great religious stir in New England many years ago. Perkins, it is clear, carefully fitted ally into the orthodox New Light paradigm. Most other Nova Scotians of the time, the evidence suggests, would have done precisely the same thing, despite all the evidence which could have pushed them into a radically different interpretive position. Those Nova Scotians who were converted under his preaching or by his disciples wished to replicate all aspects of Alain's own transforming religious experience. They too wish to see paradise. They too wish to taste but one glimmering ray of the eternal now, as Alain put it. And they yearn for Alain's Christ to ravish them to make them one with him. They sought the mountain peak of religious ecstasy, but naively underestimated how difficult it would be for them to remain there. Many would tumble to the depths of despair soon after Alain's death, but most would never forget that magic new light moment when they, like Henry Alain, had experienced Jesus Christ and had become part of his pristine spirituality and perfectibility. They had reached out and Christ had touched them. They were certain that it could happen again, and it did. Only a few years after Alain's death, as periodic revivals became a distinguishing feature of Nova Scotia's religious culture. Contemporary critics of Alain and of the New Lights, however, would perceive the evangelical ethos in a radically different manner. The Reverend Jacob Bailey, for example, the Anglican priest and loyalist writer, hated them with a finely tuned passion. In 1789, he penned a verse against the New Lights, which, though distorted by his bitter despair, and lack of any empathy for religious enthusiasm nevertheless conveyed some critical truths about his new light enemies. And Bailey's verse does, in a very real sense, provide the other side of the new light coin. Behold the gifted teacher rise and roll to heaven his half-shut eyes. In every feature of his face see stiffness, sanctity, and grace. Like whipping post erect he stands, then with a slow and gentle voice begins to make a languid noise, strives with a thousand airs to move, to melt and thaw your hearts to love. But when he fails by softening arts to mollify your frozen hearts, observe him spring with eager jump, and on the table fiercely thump. With double fist he beats the air, pours out his soul in wrathful prayer, then seized with furious agitation, screams forth a frightful exhortation, and with a sharp and hideous yell, sends all your carnal folks to hell. Now to excite your fear and wonder, tries the big jarring voice of thunder, like wounded serpent in the veil. He writhes his body and his tail, strives by each motion to express the agonies of deep distress, and groans and scolds and roars aloud till dread and frenzy fire the crowd. The madness spreads with rapid power. Confusion reigns in wild uproar, a concert grand of joyful tones, mingled with sighs and rueful moans. Some heaven extol with rapturous air, while others rave in black despair. A blended group of different voices confound and stun us with their noises. Thus, in some far and lonely sit, sight amidst the deepest glooms of night where roll the slow and sullen floods or hung with rocks and dusky woods I 
heard the wolves' terrific howl, the doleful music of the owl, the frogs and hoarser murmurs croak, while from the top of some tall oak with notes more piercing, soft and shrill, resounds the sprightly whippoorwill. These give the ears of wondrous greeting, not much unlike a pious meeting. Here blue-eyed Jenny plays her part, inured to every saint-like art. She works and heaves from head to heel with pangs of puritanic zeal. Now in a fit of deep distress, the holy maid turns prophetess, and to her light and knowledge brings a multitude of secret things. And as enthusiasm advances, falls into ecstasies and trances, herself with decency resigned to these impulses and inclined. Now, Nova Scotia, especially Yankee Nova Scotia, had in a religious sense been assiduously cultivated by Alain and his disciples throughout the revolutionary years. Though most observers agreed with Alain that by early 1781, the Great Awakening had lost much of its earlier momentum. In the Yankee heartland of the colony, he and Thomas Hanley Chipman and Joseph Bailey and John Paysant continue to preach the evangelical gospel in the more peripheral regions, such as the St. John River Valley and the South Shore. After Alline's death, these three disciples did not stop preaching, of course, but because each was now married with family responsibilities and lacking Alline's example and inspiration, they began to limit somewhat their itinerary. But a Methodist counteroffensive begun in 1785 by Freeborn Garrison, a very gifted preacher from Maryland, forced them to defend the Alanite New Light legacy. And in the process, they helped in bringing about the transformation of Alanite's disorganized sect into the Baptist Church. It should be kept in mind that during the years immediately following the end of the American War of Independence, much of Nova Scotia was experienced yet another profound and, for many, disconcerting collective sense of acute disorientation and confusion. As was the case in neighboring northern New England, hundreds of common people were cut loose from all sorts of traditional bonds and found themselves freer, more independent, more unconstrained than ever before in their history. The coming of over 20,000 loyalists to peninsular Nova Scotia at the end of the revolution accelerated a process of social dis disintegration already underway. The loyalists, according to Edward Manning, had a bad and dreadful effect on the colony, and they corrupted societal values and made many Nova Scotians adepts in wickedness. Don't tell anybody who is organizing the loyalists the bicentennial that. Thus, as Gordon Wood has argued, traditional structures of authority crumbled under the momentum of the revolution, and common people increasingly discovered that they no longer had to accept the old distinctions that had driven them into a widely perceived subservient and vulnerable status. And as might have been expected, sometime bizarre but emotionally satisfying ways of relating to God and others became increasingly widespread phenomena as many Nova Scotians sought a renewed sense of community belonging in order to neutralize the powerful forces of alienation then sweeping the colony. It was a period when it has been perceptively observed everything was believable and everything could be doubted. Radical enthusiasts and visionaries regarding themselves as the disciples of Henry Alline and as propagators of his tradition became the advance guard of the renewed popular evangelical movement with which they shared a common hostility to orthodox authority. By 1790, these new lights, as they were spitefully referred to by their enemies, were a people in a delicate state of spiritual tension, poised like a steel spring by the contradicting forces pulling within it. There was a mystical quality, but there was also a secular one. There was a democratic bias, but also an authoritarian one, a revelating emphasis and an empirical tendency, and both an obsession with individualism and a tendency towards communitarianism. For some, it seems clear the seemingly contradictory forces within the New Lights 
would soon neutralize one another, producing apathy, indifference, and disenchantment. For others, a not insignificant number, the dynamic tension would result in a renewed pietism which, be, which, which would become a crucial link in the chain connecting Henry Lyne's first Great Awakening and Nova Scotia's second Great Awakening. But for an influential minority, known as the New Dispensationalist by friends and enemies alike, the state of spiritual tension brought about by the coming of the Loyalists, the Garrisonian revival, the continuing influence of Alline's legacy, and growing American sectarian influences provided a heaven-sent opportunity to stretch Alline's gospel to and beyond the antinomian breaking point. Critically important actors in the unfolding New Light drama in Nova Scotia in the decade or so following Alline's quitting the colony were Edward Manning and James Manning, Joseph Dimmick and Harris Harding. All of these men played key roles not only in breathing new life into the New Light movement in the late, 1880, uh, late 1780s, but also in an encouraging and in facilitating, for a time at least, the growth of New Dispensationalism. Moreover, after the New Dispensationalists had spun off into a state of spiritual anarchy, they helped to undermine the new divisive and embarrassing sect by, among other things, channeling a New Light majority into the Calvinist Baptist Church. The evidence suggests that some of Alline's followers, even during his lifetime, and let me stress this point, probably spun his New Light gospel in the direction of antinomianism. Having experienced the ravishing of the spirit and the rapture of the new birth, these men and women could not imagine how they could lose their salvation. And their confidence and certainty of redemption was such that they became increasingly indifferent to sin and to contemporary moral standards. Most of Alline's followers, of course, were not antinomians, but some were for varying lengths of time, especially in the New Light Heartland area of Cornwallis and Falmouth and in Cumberland and along the St. John River Valley. The most significant manifestation of New Light antinomian antinomianism probably occurred in 1791 in the Cornwallis area. At the core of the movement were to be found Harris Hardy, Edward Manning and his brother James, and Joseph Dimmick, as well as the influential teacher Thomas Bennett and Lydia Randall. For at least one, side for at least one outside observer, Freeborn Garrison, Mrs. Randall was evidently, as he put it, their head speaker. And according to the Reverend John Paysant, an insider, she orchestrated in May of 1791 the denunciation of all the orders of the church. As far as other contemporaries were concerned, Harris Harding was probably the principal actor in the so-called New Dispensation Movement. The persistent struggle with his New Dispensation enemies both exhausted and depressed Paysant, who in April of 1793 jumped at the opportunity to minister to the Liverpool New Light Congregational Church. Two years later, Edward Manning was ordained the minister, as the minister of the Cornwallis New Light Church. By late 1793, it seems clear, the New Dispensation Movement was on the decline, especially in the Horton Cornwallis region. The Mannings and Joseph Dimmick, and possibly Thomas Bennett, had been frightened and then appalled by the antinomian excesses practiced by some of their former associates and friends. Moreover, the chaos and disorder which seemed endemic to the movement appeared to threaten seriously the already fragile underpinnings of Nova Scotia society. Short-term ecstasy was one thing. Permanent confusion and disorientation was quite a different matter. It should be kept in mind that in 1791, Harding was 31 years old, Joseph Dimmick was 24, James Manning 28, and Edward 26. All were still unmarried, and the evidence suggests physically attractive, full of energy, and convinced that they were divinely ordained instruments for the spiritual transformation not only of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, but also of New England. Their preoccupation with itinerating helped considerably not only to extend the territorial boundaries 
of the 1789 Reformation, but also to encourage the extraordinary growth of both the new dispensation movement and what may be regarded as an energized new light pietism. But by late 1793, the evidence suggests that the Mannings and Joseph Dimmick had declared their independence of the increasingly Manichean-oriented new dispensationalists and had chosen instead to be at the cutting edge of, re of a renewed and a far more orthodox pietism. In other words, these men reacting violently against antinomian excesses they no longer could condone or control returned to the Whitfieldian Alanite framework, but one which no longer emphasized as it, as it had the importance as it once had, the importance of feelings and impressions. Harris Harding, however, continued to preach what Simeon Perkins called the antinomian doctrine. And he remained, I think, a principal actor in the movement until the concluding years of the 18th century. And there would be those in Nova Scotia who would argue that he remained sympathetic to the movement until his death in 1854. But these critics, I think, are wrong. Harding in the 19th century was not an advocate of new dispensationalism. Rather, he continued to be an enthusiastic disciple of Henry Alline and what was frequently referred to as Alanism. After he became the general factotum of the Nova Scotia Baptist Church and an ardent Calvinist and a vociferous critic of New Light enthusiasm, Edward Manning attempted to describe what he considered to be the heart of new dispensationalism. Mr. Alline's lack, lax observance of divine institutions fostered in the minds of his followers such ideas as these, that the ordinances are only circumstantials, outward matters, and mere non-essentials, that the scriptures are not the only rule of faith and practice, and that no person is under any obligation to perform any external duty until God immediately impresses the mind so to do. Several began to question the, the propriety of having anything to do with external order or ordinances and soon refused to commune with the church, as they had no rule to go by but their fancies, which they call the Spirit of God, great irregularities ensued. Manning, who for the remainder of his life would be embarrassed by his close association in the 1790 to 1792 period with the, new with the new dispensationalists, had deftly cut to the heart of the movement's ideology. Here was a man who had played a key role in coaxing the movement into existence and who had, moreover, significantly affected its evolution. If any single person understood new dispensationalism and its appeal, Edward Manning certainly did. As far as he was concerned, it was Alline's lax observance of divine institutions and his emphasis on the spirit of liber liberty and individual illumination, which persuaded many of his followers to break out of the radical evangelical and new light framework to enjoy what to many was regarded as Quaker and Shaker freedom. There was a deep desire to experiment to shatter existing religious values, to reshape fundamentally evangelical individualism, and to challenge frontally community norms. With the Spirit of God within him, having experienced the profound intensity and the rapture of the new birth, having been ravished by the Almighty, anything seemed possible and permissible. Their sin had been canceled out once and for all by the sacrifice of Christ, and sinning whether in the flesh or the Spirit could not distance them from their Savior. Instead of turning toward ecstatic behavior as Alline had preached and practiced, many new dispensationalists driven by the spirit of liberty and in order to test the viability of their new birth and to flaunt their spiritual hubris at their neighbors committed what Manning called their extravagancies. Their great irregularities obviously served a number of interrelated purposes. They were the means whereby one could both enjoy sin and appreciate salvation, no insignificant accomplishment in any age. Antinomian excesses, moreover, enabled men and women to express freely and creatively their innermost emotional and sexual, sexual desires and drives at a time and in an age 
when such behavior was regarded as being sinfully aberrant. It would be a serious mistake, however, to suppose that all those individuals described by their critics as new dispensationists were, in fact, guilty of gross antinomian excesses. Some were, but how many it is now impossible to say. Far more, the vast majority, inspired by the spirit of liberty, were satisfied with questioning existing church rules and regulations and with propagating a fundamental restructuring of religious worship. This questioning of authority, as well as this actual assertion of independence, was, it may be argued, a revolutionary development. Societal values were challenged frontally and found disconcertingly wanting. These people, in many respects, were Alanites. They were regarded by their enemies as disciples of the Falmouth preacher and proudly perceived themselves in precisely the same manner. They were carrying on as traditions in a colony which had abandoned the principles undergirding the First Great Awakening, or this is what they thought. During the second decade of the 19th century, what were then disparagingly referred to as the old New Lights were still trying desperately to keep alive the essentials of Alain's gospel. These men and women were not then regarded as, as antinomian extremists, probably most never had been. Rather, as one critic succinctly put it, they were genuine Christians. They had, he went on, more experiences than doctrine, more imagination than judgment, more spiritualism than spirituality, more of the ideal than the substantial. Then he went on. They had no ordinances, no creed, no discipline. They paid little or nothing to support religion, either at home or abroad. To pay money for religion was, was with them one of the greatest abominations the sun ever shone upon. But they believed in regeneration by the Spirit, in Christ as the Savior, and in heaven and in hell. But they were not uniform or at all agreed in what they did believe. Their religion was all feeling. Everything in the Bible and the Old and New Testament was but an allegory and was what all Christian experience. Abel was nothing but the new spiritual life working in us and his acceptable offering, humility, love, and faith. The sacrifice is acceptable to God. According to the Reverend David Nutter, their notions about religion were the most singular I had ever met with. Nutter was, he stressed, exceedingly amused, not to say entertained, to hear them explain scripture history and scripture characters to notice how flexible and versatile the imagination of one can become by use and practice. But despite, despite this, this, this criticism, Nutter still regarded these disciples of Alain as, as he put it, genuine Christians. They were old new lights, indeed. And because of the challenge they posed to the burgeoning Baptist church in Nova Scotia, they were unceremoniously pushed into a dark corner of oblivion. The new lights were an embarrassing reminder of what so many Nova Scotia Calvinist Baptists had once been. And there was a deep psychological need, apparently, for key Calvinist Baptist leaders to try to wipe the collective memory free of Alain's peculiar views. But in the process, not only was Alain's heterodoxy excised from the Nova Scotia Calvinist Baptist mind, but also much of his radical evangelicalism. Thus, in their desperate search for respectability and order, the Nova Scotia Baptist leadership of the 19th century jettisoned much of the emotionalism and evangelical spirituality which was at the heart of Alain's message. The result, in a particularly ironic twist of fate, was that the Baptists, in many respects, appropriated much of the theological perspective of 18th century Calvinist congregationalism. There would therefore be some truth in the contention that the views of Jonathan Scott were as significant an influence on evolving 19th century Nova Scotia Baptist development as were those of Henry Alain. Scott's a brief view had actually triumphed over Alain's two mites after all, or had it. At one level it triumphed at the level of leadership among men like Edward Manning, for example, 
But at the grassroots level, Elline's influence continued to be of considerable importance. As Esther Clark Wright has correctly observed, too little has been written in the existing sparse literature about the significant work of the layman in maintaining the Baptist churches. The competency of the individual religion, she has asserted, make it possible to carry on without prophet, priest, or king, or even an ordained Baptist minister. In many regions of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, concerned lay people, many of whom were familiar with the Alanite traditions and its new light manifestations, stubbornly resisted the seeming inexorable flow of the Baptist Calvinist mainstream. If any one individual was responsible for the significant downplaying of the new light influence in the maritime Baptist tradition, it was Edward Manning. Reacting violently against his own new light free will past, Manning did everything in his power to ensure that the new light legacy would atrophy into dark oblivion. Manning was haunted by his Alanite past and determined that the painful lesson he had learned in the 1790s would become his denomination's major ideological construct. Moreover, he accurately linked the remarkable growth of the Free Will Baptists in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick with what he once called Alanism, which he argued made people more confounded than comforted. Throughout the first half of the 19th century until his death in 1851, Manning did everything in his power to encourage his Baptist church to define its separate identity by behaving in a radically different manner from the Alanite free will Baptist enthusiasts. Manning did not want to abandon his revised version of the Whitfieldian paradigm. What he wished to do was to get rid of what he regarded as new light excesses and extravagancy. Some might argue that this response was merely the working out of what I've also referred to earlier as what Freud once called the narcissism of small differences. Others would argue, perhaps more persuasively, that Manning and the Baptist ministerial elite remain obsessed with respectability and were eager to sacrifice an integral part of their rich historical tradition in order to become a respectable part of the maritime Protestant consensus. They had overreacted, quite understandably, to new dispensationalism by exaggerating, among other things, its appeal. Moreover, they had underestimated the broadly based popular support for Henry Alline's brand of new light radical evangelicalism that continued to undergird both the free will and Calvinist Baptists until at least late in the 19th century. It has recently been argued that Alline's Great Awakening prepared the way for the breakdown of the old order and the emergence of another social framework. And the New Dispensation Movement was part of this. But it would be a serious distortion of the historical past to suggest, either implicitly or explicitly, that the Nova Scotia Baptist Church in the post aline period was simply what has been described as a negative reaction to the antinomian challenge of the early 1790s. Obviously, the sudden and to some remarkable growth of the Calvinist Baptist movement owed something to this defensive response. But even this response must be viewed in a larger perspective and must also take into account a variety of complex forces and the roles played by a number of principal participants. One of these was Thomas Hanley Chipman, an early Allied convert who, unlike his mentor, regarded adult baptism as anything but a non-essential. Soon after his conversion, Chipman had been baptized by immersion in 1779. And if any single individual in Nova Scotia pushed the New Life movement in the direction of the Baptist Church early, it was Chipman from his vantage point at Granville. Chipman was successful in accomplishing this, and because he was widely known and deeply revered throughout Nova Scotia as one of Alline's closest associates. He had traveled widely with Alline. He had preached with him. He had suffered with Alline. 
and he had shared in the Falmouth minister's spiritual ecstasy and black morbid introspection. In a very real sense, Chipman had been, legitimi had been legitimized by Allied's success and friendship. He struggled long and hard to prevent the new light mainstream from being absorbed by antinomian new dispensationalism. But he did more than this. After the defeat of New Dispensationalism, Chipman assiduously channeled New Light Revivalism into a Calvinist Baptist organizational framework. What has sometimes been referred to as Nova Scotia's Second Great Awakening began in the late 1790s and continued until at least 1810. At the cutting edge of the spiritual movement, the Great Reformation, as contemporaries refer to it, were Alanite disciples like Chipman, Harris Harding, the Mannings, and Joseph Dimmick. The awakening seemed to begin at Horton, and then radiated in all directions, up into the St. John River Valley, into Cumberland, down the Annapolis Valley, to Yarmouth, into Argyle, and Barrington. It was, in many respects, a Baptist revival. There was therefore a great deal of truth in Bishop Charles Inglis's report to the SPG, in which he warned of the prevalence of an enthusiastic and dangerous spirit among a sect in the province called New Light, whose religion seems to be a strange jumble of New England independence and feminism. Formerly they were pedobaptists, but by a recent illumination they have adopted the Anabaptist scheme, by which their number has been such much increased and their zeal inflamed. Inglis was particularly concerned with Harris Harding's impact. According to the bishop, intelligence for the Yarmouth area stressed that, in quotes, a rage for dipping or total immersion prevails all over the western counties of the province and is frequently performed in a very indelicate manner before vast collections of people. Several hundreds have already been baptized, and this plunging they deem to be absolutely necessary to the conversion of their souls. On the Saturday preceding these solemnities, the preacher sits above the congregation with a number of select brethren on lower benches appointed to assist him. Inglis also charged the Baptist leaders were, in, quote, in quotes, engaged in a general plan of total revolution, in revolution in civil government, in religion in civil government, end of quote. Clearly there was no substantiation for this charge or for Inglis's contention that Baptist preachers were dangerously influenced by the work of Thomas Paine. The Anglican bishop, despite some of the glaring inaccuracies in his report, nevertheless had correctly perceived the important transformation of many new lights into Baptists. Concerned about the need for order and discipline, Paysant, the Mannings, and Thomas Hanley Chipman had met in July 1797 and agreed to walk together in fellowship as ministers of Jesus Christ to hold a yearly conference to know our minds and the state of the different churches standing in connection by their delegates being sent by them. In June of 1798, the conference took place in Court Wallace. According to Edward Manning's minutes, Mr. Hanley Chipman spoke concerning the nature of an association, met again at five o'clock, discoursed largely upon the necessity of order and discipline in the churches, and continued until midnight in observing the dangerous tendency of erroneous principles and practices and lamenting the unhappy consequences in our churches. Harris Harding requested admission to the conference. It was pointed out that he had, he had, in quotes, deeply fallen into errors by continuing to espouse the cause of new dispensationalism. Harding professed sorrow humbly acknowledged his offenses, signed a document to that effect, craved forgiveness of his brethren, and was received. Sometime in 1799, the Reverend Thomas Hanley Chippen visited Boston to confer with the Reverend Samuel Stillman, the influential minister of the First Baptist Church in Boston, about the suit brought against Enoch Towner, an ordained Baptist minister, for conducting an illegal marriage. Chipman was also in Boston collecting ammunition for his final assault on the decaying outworks of the New Light Church. At the annual conference held in 1800, Chipman presented a closed Baptist communion plan. The Reverend John Paysant was furious. 
When he confronted Chipman, the Annapolis preacher replied, in quote, that Mr. Towner had been sued for marrying, and in order to defend the suit, he'd adopted that plan, that they might be called by some name, for they were now looked upon as nobody. As Baptists, they would have some status in the community. They could stress their link with the Danbury Association in New England. Without this link, without the name, they were without power and influence. It was proposed that the association name be changed from Congregational and Baptist to the Nova Scotia Baptist Association. The Mannings, Dimmick, Chipman, the Hardings and Towner, Joseph Crandall, but not Paysan, accepted their certificates as members of the Baptist Association. It was then agreed by the Baptist ministers there that as many aspersions are cast upon the churches of Christ and the ministers of the gospel for erroneous principles, etc., the associated ministers and messengers judge it expedient that our church articles of faith and practice should be printed and the churches in connection should defray the expense of printing said articles and the plan of association. Certain key Alanites had in 1800 become Nova Scotia Baptists, but there were some reluctant signers, including Harris Harding and Joseph Dimmick. Both had been very close to the new light Alanites in the post-1784 period, and both of whom remained for a time suspicious both of Calvinism's allure and the advisability of closed communion churches. Eventually, three churches, Yarmouth, Argyle, and Chester, withdrew from the Baptist Association, largely over the matter of closed communion, and each of these churches had close ties with Harris Hardy. In 1808, there were over 1,200 members in the 11 Nova Scotia churches belonging to the association. In 1809, after, with, after with the withdrawal, there were only 753 in the eight closed communion Baptist churches. Harris Harding's church had been the second largest in the association, 250 strong in comparison with Horton's 276. It was not until 1828 that Harding's church was reunited to the association. In 1811, Chester rejoined, and 1837 Argyle, in somewhat different form, returned to the Baptist fold. It would be a mistake, I think, to exaggerate the influence of the six so-called patriarchs the Mannings, Chipman, the Hardings, and Joseph Dimmick, and the fascinating symbiotic relationship connecting Nova Scotia's Second Great Awakening with the transformation of the New Light Movement in the Baptist Church. Nor should these be underestimated. They were not charismatic religious leaders in the Alanite tradition, nor were they organizational giants like the Reverend Timothy Dwight, who from his Yale University base helped to orchestrate the Second Great Awakening in, in New England in the 1795 to 1870, 1817 period. But it, it may be argued that they were an important link between the first and the second Great Awakening. In a very real sense, they succeeded in applying the basic Alline paradigm of revitalization to another chronological period and to a different mix of people. It was a paradigm which stressed the central importance of the conversion experience, piety, biblical literalism, and the pure church ideal. In many respects, the human links between the two awakenings were sensitive reflectors of the religious aspirations of the thousands of Nova Scotians to whom they diligently preached their often emotional and introspective version of the Christian gospel. American influences, direct and indirect, events in Europe, Economic and social stress in Nova Scotia may have provided the general framework in which the Second Great Awakening worked itself out. Yet without such men, no great reformation would have been possible. And without them, moreover, the Great Reformation would have been quite a different kind of religious movement. According to the 1827 Nova Scotia census, the New Light Baptist counteroffensive had been amazingly successful. The total population of Nova Scotia in 1827 was estimated at about 142,000. This included about 31,000 Anglican, 42,000 Presbyterian, 31,000 Roman Catholic, and about 20,000 Baptists, 9,000 Methodists, about 3,000 Lutherans, and about 5,000 of other denominations. The Baptist percentage in 1827 was 16%. 
and the method is 17, uh, 7.6. By 1871, there were 73,000 Baptists, 19% of the total Nova Scotia population of 387,000, and uh, only 40,000 Methodists, 10% of the total. In New Brunswick by mid-century, the Baptists were the largest Protestant denomination. Alliance disciples in their 19th century Baptist manifestation had indeed made remarkable numerical gains. There are two other important ways in which Alliance's New Light legacy affected Maritime Baptists in particular and the region's evangelical ethos in general. This New Light legacy, it may be argued, had a far more lasting and profound impact on the religious ethos of New Brunswick than on Nova Scotia. The experience of Elder James Innes, a New Brunswick Baptist preacher in Nova Scotia in 1805, is, I think, extremely illuminating in this regard. Innes was a former British soldier who settled in New Brunswick after the American Revolution. Uneducated, a farmer, he was after his conversion ordained as an elder in the Norton Baptist Church in 1800 by Edward Manning and Theodore Seth Harding of Cornwallis and Horton, respectively. Innes authored a fascinating diary in which he both implicitly and explicitly distinguished his New Brunswick, New Light, Alanite views from the ordered Calvinism of the two Nova Scotia patriarchs, Manning and Theodore Seth Harding. While visiting Nova Scotia in 1805 as an itinerant, Innes preached first in the Horton area. With Harding present, Innes opened the meeting with a song and prayer, and then opened my Bible and gave out a text. While he was preaching to what he referred to as a house full of people, a woman near him fell at full length on the floor, crying for mercy and beating the floor with her hand. Others in the congregation were soon all rejoicing in the Lord in wonderful manner. The following day, Innes preached in the regular church service and reached many hearts and brought many tears and caused the sister to break out in praise to God. Seven came forward and told their experiences, he observed. Six they received, but would not receive one that was colored, which caused much contention between me and Mr. Harding and the church. As far as the indignant Innes was concerned, Harding was not justified in shutting the gates of heaven against her because of her color. He denounced Harding as being nothing better than a hireling and to let the people go free. Harding replied by telling Innes that he could preach, but that only the Horton minister could baptize. A few days later, Harding was no longer certain that Innes should even be preaching in the area. His roving commission was creating divisions in the community, and his preaching was triggering embarrassing emotional excesses. News about the Harding-Innes controversy reached Edward Manning before Innes actually arrived in the Cornwallis area. According to Innes, Manning thought that every sheep should bow to his sheep. But the New Brunswick preacher told him, my order was to salute no man, as I was desired by the tender spirit of God, for he seemed to think I ought to go as he desired, but I came to cry against the altar of Baal. Our conversation in this reported was not like that was engaged the advancement of the dear Redeemer's kingdom, for he thought himself somebody, but I was nothing and less than nothing. Moreover, Manning blamed Innes for making Christians before God had made them. The Manning-Harding negative reaction to Innes was shaped, it seems clear to me, by a deeply held fear of both the style and the substance of the New Brunswick preacher's message. Innes loved to encourage what he once described as the bitter pangs of the new birth. And he furthermore often underscored the truth of Henry Alline's gospel. Not only did Innes evidently question the validity of Calvinism, but he also questioned the role of the settled minister. 
like Aline and like Manning in his earlier career, Ennis was determined, as he put it, to cry against the altar of Baal wherever the Holy Spirit directed him. And as far as Ennis was concerned, his own experience and that of others he knew well convincingly showed that the true lit religion was of the heart and not of the head. When he died in 1817, his religious views had not altered despite what he once described as the great trials and struggles in my own mind, the powers of darkness worked much with me. The powers of darkness which confronted the Reverend Thomas Griffin in St. John in 1818 were quite different from those which had assailed Innes a few years earlier. In fact, these powers, as far as Griffin was concerned, were those influencing the Innes New Light tradition. Griffin was a distinguished Baptist minister from Kinderminster, England. He became minister of Germain Street Baptist Church, St. John, either in late 1817 or early in 1818. His sojourn in New Brunswick, however, was brief. By 1819, he had made his way to Philadelphia to serve a Baptist church there. In his correspondence with Edward Manning, Griffin emphasized his lack of sympathy and empathy for what he knew as New Brunswick New Light Baptist. English Baptist Calvinist dec decorum and its Nova Scotia variant was one thing. New Light enthusiasm, on the other hand, was quite another. We have a few of the New Light sort amongst us, Griffin informed Manning in September of 1818. They want to feel religion, that is, something to fer ferment like yeast and then as flat as water, something that will set them going though they live in neglect of watchfulness, prayer, and God's ordinances. Griffin then concluded, my idea of religion are of a more rational and permanent kind. The enjoyment of God must be in duty, though not for it, and always stands connected with holiness, not an in and out noisy, irreverent profession, but an humble daily walk with God. Early in November, Griffin developed further his anti-New Brunswick New Light critique. It is grievous to see people taken with any person who comes, he sadly reported to Manning, and evinced the want of stability and judgment in this manner. The man take a text and totally forget it, speak in the most improper manner as to pronunciation, snuff at the nose as if nothing should be lost, and dance with feet like a weaver in his loom, contradict himself often, and speak as you could not discuss whether he be an Arminian or not, this will do. You must not suppose our people are generally of this sort described, Griffin added, but there's enough to make a minister uneasy. But many things shall be omitted, or you will think me of a murmuring disposition. I cannot lick people's feet. I cannot disguise my sentiments. In short, I am too much of John Bull. In that last sentence, Griffin cogently summarized his basic difference with those so-called new lights in his congregation. And he knew, moreover, that Manning enthusiastically endorsed his position. Manning, too, refused to lick people's feet. Manning, too, was attached to a structured Baptist Calvinist position in theology as well as in church polity. And like Griffin, but more explicitly, Manning was preoccupied with Henry Alliance's continuing impact on Nova Scotia and New Brunswick religious life. As far as Manning was concerned, Aline was directly responsible for what he once called in 1820 the flood of Arminianism surging through the region. For Manning, Aline's errors did not die with him. No, they lived to the sorrow of many and me among the rest. After rereading in 1820, Jonathan Scott's bitter 1784 attack on Aline's view, contained in his A Brief View, perhaps the longest book ever published under the title A Brief View, Manning, who had once been an ardent new light and new dispensationalist, declared, I think I could seal Mr. Scott's sentiments with my blood. Like his friend Edmund, Edmund Rice, Manning passionately believed that the preaching which is the most blessed is that of the sovereignty of God and total depravity of man. That and that alone takes the crown from the creature and places it on the Creator. Moreover, it was agreed in sharp contrast to New Light emotionalism and Alanite mysticism that a true preacher of the word should be careful not to encourage bodily agitation. 
which, according to Manning, profited little, but strive to inform the understanding more than move the passions, which latter may be done without the mind being informed, but much prudence is necessary in so doing. True religion must be felt as well as understood. Zeal is very useful, and preachers without it seldom prove beneficial, but it should be accomplished with wisdom, lest it should do, as it is often done, much harm. Evangelical religion for Manning was a careful mixture of informed understanding and felt zeal, as he put it. But because of the strength of the New Light Free Will Baptists' counteroffensive, with its emphasis on the emotions, Manning tended during the latter part of his life to stress the central importance of reasoned order. And if any one person pushed the Nova Scotia Baptist mainstream in the 19th century in the direction of Calvinist order and away from New Light Free Grace, it of course was Edward Manning. Until his death in 1851, Manning was widely regarded in the province and with good reason as the Baptist Pope. His spiritual hegemony, however, never extended to New Brunswick, or at least much beyond St. John and Sackville, and this too helps to explain some of the basic differences between the Baptist religious cultures, culture in that province and in Nova Scotia, not only in the 19th century, but also in the 20th century. Manning's ordered Baptist Calvinism, it, may, it should be stressed, was not only the result of his powerful reaction to the new dispensationalism of the, and the Alanite mysticism, which he both practiced and preached in the early 1790s, nor was it simply Manning's attempt to become more respectable and influential, or as James Innes put it so well, that he was a special somebody. Of course, the significance of Manning's search for respectability and power should never be underestimated, nor should his considerable powers of manipulation and influence. But not only did Manning profoundly influence others, some would say he stamped his own denomination with his own personal Calvinist conservative imprint. He also was manipulated and influenced by others. Four Haligonians, in particular, used their prestige and their power to ensure that Manning's Baptist Church was the kind of church they could support. All of these men, J.W. Johnson, who had become Premier of Nova Scotia, E.A. Crawley, who became a Baptist minister and educational leader, J.W. Nutting, and John Ferguson, a leading Halifax merchant, had been members of the Saint of St. Paul's Anglican Church, Halifax. A split in this church between evangelical and non-evangelical non factions resulted in these four men and others leaving the Anglican Church and becoming Baptists. And he brought with him to their new denomination a deep-seated Calvinism and a preoccupation with order and respectability. Their views were widely disseminated in the denominations weekly, The Christian Messenger, edited by Nutting and Ferguson. Professor Barry Moody, I think, has persuasively shown how this small group of new Halifax Baptists, how they pushed the regular Baptists into support for higher education at Horton Academy and Acadia University. It was realized, Moody argues, that if the Baptists were to attract and hold people of such standing, a more educated clergy would be essential. Such an educated clergy, moreover, would give the denomination badly needed respectability and finalize the transformation of the 18th century sect into the 19th century church. But what Moody refers to as the New Baptists did more than this. They also, during the 1840s, played key roles in pushing many Baptists in Nova Scotia from the reform camp where they had once huddled into the Conservative Party led by J.W. Johnson. The issue was provincial support for Acadia College. Joseph Howe's opposition to this support, influenced to a great extent by his controversy with the co-editors of the Christian Messenger, certainly exacerbated Manning's distrust of the Tribune of Nova Scotia. In fact, Manning declared in the fall of 1843 that the Almighty, in quote, had given Acadia to the Baptists and they were bound to sustain it. It was an institution that breathed benevolence and looked benignly even on those like Howe who have a dagger under their coats ready to thrust it. It was God's institution. Do not let us desert it. The inference was clear in Manning's speech. 
as Professor J.M. Beck has recently argued. Johnson Tories were doing God's work. A half century earlier, Manning, his associate Harris Harding, Joseph Dimmick, and his brother James were just as convinced the devil's work was being done by the educated ministers of Nova Scotia who were puffed up into minions of Antichrist by the hubris of their book learning. In the 1840s, Alline's New Life followers, many of whom were to be found in New Brunswick, used these same old shibboleths from the 1790s to condemn book learning and all that it represented. This New Light anti-intellectualism would be a powerful, though gradually diminishing force in the religious culture of both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, not only in the 19th century, but also throughout the 20th century. The Halifax Baptists obviously found Manning and other members of the Nova Scotia Baptist leadership elite to be surprisingly pliable. And consequently, the conservative pro-British bias they endorsed was free to do its John Bull work in the Nova Scotia Baptist denomination. This anglicization process was at work at all levels of provincial society. So that by mid-century, because of its influence and because of certain demographic and cultural trends in Nova Scotia, not only did certain conservative not only did a certain conservative political culture set and set hard, but also a religious ethos set and set hard, an ethos in which the regular Baptists were very much at home. Manning's growing conservatism, a conservatism which gradually became the Baptist mainstream in Nova Scotia, was obviously significantly affected by his neg negative response to the divisive forces unleashed by the New Dispensation Movement in the 1790s, by his own desperate search for respectability, order and power, as well as by the growing influence of the Massachusetts Maine Calvinist Baptists, and after 1825, of the so-called New Halifax Baptists. And all these factors help to explain some of the differences that I see between the Baptists of New Brunswick and the Baptists of Nova Scotia. There's a second way that the Alanite New Light legacy also affected the religious culture of the region. As might have been expected, the so-called ravishing new birth experience provided the central core of Alain's preaching and his theology. By pumping mystical and what he called free grace enthusiasm into the Whitfieldian evangelical paradigm, Alain set the tone and shaped the substance, the peculiar brand of maritime spiritual individualism which would significantly affect the religious culture of the region. His was a religion, or more accurately put, a way of life, which was preoccupied with the individual, special, and ongoing personal relationship with Christ and concerned with eternal verities, rather than with here and now and ephemeral societal problems. Clearly seeing himself as being very much involved in a bitter cosmic struggle between the forces of evil as represented by Satan and the forces of righteousness as personified by Christ, Alain and his thousands of followers had little real interest in actualizing impossible dreams on earth. Their new Jerusalem, in other words, was to be located in the Almighty's heaven and not in Nova Scotia or in New Brunswick. Alain had absolutely no desire, nor was he tempted, to develop a mature and sophisticated social and political ethic which could either influence or challenge institutions and power relationships. In neighboring New England, as Professor J.L. Thomas has suggestively argued, the post-1820 period witnessed the transformation of the old Whitfieldian individualistic evangelical impulse into a creative social reform thrust. The new social concern emphasized the regeneration of the entire social order by immediate action aimed at freeing individuals from what Thomas calls the restraints of institutions and precedent. Maritime evangelicals in the 19th century, especially those directly and indirectly influenced by Alain, neither experienced this secularization of their faith nor the metamorphosis of their entire value structure. 
They obviously were largely unaffected by the so-called theological revolution, which Thomas and others have maintained was at the cutting edge of Northern reform in the United States. Nor did romantic perfectionism or post-millennial optimism energize Alain's gospel or the 19th century maritime evangelical social conscience. Alain's conviction that personal salvation should be man's obsession became the evangelical norm. There was little interest, therefore, in perfecting man and maritime society. As Alain had once explained in his two mites, you are to consider yourself with a few hours of probation cut out of eternal now, neither elected nor reprobate, but with electing love all around you. Consider neither time past nor time to come, but one eternal now. Consider that with God there is neither succession nor progression, but that with him the moment he said, let us make man and the sound of the last trumpet is the very same instant, and your death as, merry, as much first as your birth. With God all things are now as the center of a ring, which is as near to one side as the other. There was, according to the Alline grasp of spiritual reality, a special sense of urgency for men and women to be redeemed by the electing love of God, since the instant moment of conversion was really an endless eternity. Within Alline's cosmic drama, then, the shrill shibboleths of social and political reform were meaningless and empty noises. An Alanite otherworldliness linked to spiritual individualism certainly discouraged the coming into existence of any strong evangelical social ethic and social concern in the maritime region. Regenerating individuals, it was contended, could only produce a more humane society. Regenerating society through structural and political reform was therefore regarded as being both anti-Christian and humanly and institutionally impossible. Thank you.